All right. Well, good day to you all, or kia ora, as we say in New Zealand, uh, wherever you are around the world, and welcome to today's panel discussion event. Uh, there are people trickling in. I think they'll continue to do so uh, over the next few minutes. Uh, I'm John Borry, and I'm a senior resident fellow at the UN Institute for Disarmament Research. Some of you know me from previous hats I've worn, uh, including as the Institute's research coordinator, its officer in charge until the end of 2020, and uh, as its uh, former program lead on WMD and other strategic weapons. And I've followed the humanitarian initiative pretty much uh, since its beginning. And uh, so I have a big interest in the TPNW. And uh, I think that all of our panelists uh, today uh, do as well. And this event is the fourth in a series of online UNIDARE events that we've been running this year on the implementation of uh, the new Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Already, uh, we've organized uh, sessions on national implementation, victim assistance, and environmental remediation. Uh, institutional support, and last week one moderated by my colleague, uh, Dr. Pa Pavel Podvig, on compliance, verification, and enforcement of the TPNW. And you can find all of these events uh, on YouTube, uh, and uh, indeed if you search by keyword Unidea and TPNW, you'll find those on YouTube, but you can also find them by going to the events tab on our website at unidea.org, and uh, you'll be able to find your way through. And uh, we'll also post a web link uh, in the chat box uh, that uh, you'll see shortly. So as all of you know, uh, the treaty entered into force on the 22nd of January of this year after achieving the magic number of 50 state ratifications mm -hmm. late last year. And this means that after all of the Durman straying about the TPNW since its adoption in July 2017, this new regime is becoming a reality. But what is that going to mean in practical terms? Critics and opponents of the TPNW have long contended that it won't be effective for various reasons. And we're not really going to go into those criticisms today, but it does prompt the question, what do the TPNW's members and supporters need to do in order to give the treaty a firm footing as a viable regime? And what are the kinds of decisions uh, that need to be made early in its life? Specifically, what will the first meeting of the TPNW states parties uh, have to decide? And what should the practical priorities be for the regime? What parts should states, civil society, and international organizations play respectively? So our previous events in this series have touched on some of these issues, but we're going to talk about that in more detail today. And also historical experience with other international treaties suggests that putting in place effective implementation uh, mechanisms can contain challenges that we can learn from. And in setting out their views, our panel experts today, I guess, will draw on some of those experiences. So I'd like to welcome our four excellent panelists. Uh, Alicia Sanders uh, Zachary is a policy and research coordinator at the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, or ICANN, which won the Nobel Peace Prize, of course, uh, quite recently. She's also served on the board of directors for the Campaign for Peace, Disarmament and Common Security, as well as a number of other posts. Dr. Irene Gyorgu is a legal advisor in international humanitarian law and weapons law at the International Committee of the Red Cross in Geneva, with extensive experience in multilateral disarmament diplomacy. Next, we have Dr. Nick Ritchie, who's a senior lecturer in international security at York University in the United Kingdom. And Nick's written extensively on issues related to nuclear disarmament, non-proliferation, and arms control, including a publication on a hegemonic nuclear order, understanding the ban treaty, and the power politics of nuclear weapons as well as several policy-oriented publications uh, on the TPMW with Unidea. So uh, you'll see that our producer, Letitia, has just posted uh, a link uh, to Nick's article. It's worth checking out. Uh, it's behind a, behind a paywall. So if you do want the PDF, you don't have access uh, behind the paywall, uh, I'm sure if you contact us, uh, Unidea, we can, uh, we can do something about that and get you access for a copy of the article. And last but not least, Dr. Jamie Walsh is Ireland's Deputy Permanent Representative to the Conference on Disarmament in Geneva. And previously, he was Deputy Director for Disarmament and Nonproliferation with the Irish Department for Foreign Affairs in Dublin. 
Jamie, as well as having a PhD from University College Cork on nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation, uh, has also deep experience uh, with the TPNW. Now, all panelists uh, today are speaking in their personal capacities. These are their views, not necessarily those of the organizations they work for. Uh, so just bear that in mind. So what we're gonna do is have a moderated conversation, including questions that you as attendees can submit to the panel using our meetings Q&A function. You can see the Q&A function. If you wiggle your cursor on your mouse, uh, you can see a Q&A um, icon down the bottom of the screen below the windows. And if you click on that, uh, you'll be able to ask questions. Uh, so do post your questions. I'll monitor these and seek to inject them into the discourse. Uh, it can, uh, I think other participants may not be able to see your question, but don't worry, uh, we will. Uh, but our standard disclaimer applies, and that's that we'll get to as many questions as we can, but we make no promises in view of limited time. And uh, we'll also continue to use the chat function to post information for you that we think uh, you might find useful. So uh, without further ado, uh, let's get into it. So Irene, um, can you help us paint the scene here? I mean, now that the TPNW has entered into force, what happens next? I mean, what has to be done in practical and legal terms, according to the treaty? What decisions does the first meeting of states parties have to make? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, John. Delighted to be on this panel. Um, I think these are two very good, slightly different questions. One has to do with uh, what states parties need to do in terms of positive obligations under the treaty. And there's a number of those, I won't go through them each individually, obviously, but implementing those positive obligations, especially the time bound ones, is very important to set the treaty on a, on a firm footing, as you said yourself earlier. So submitting declarations to the UN Secretary General, according to Article 2, a number of states have already done that. Uh, it's important that all state parties do it within the deadline. Um, ICRC has produced a model declaration for those states that are interested in having guidance on, on this. It's available on our website. Um, having a comprehensive safeguards agreement in place with the IAEA. There is, to my knowledge, one TPNW state party currently that doesn't have a CSA in force and needs to do so within a designated deadline. So that's another important positive obligation. Taking all necessary measures to uh, integrate the treaty into the domestic legal framework. So all legal measures needed to make TPNW national law. Uh, another positive obligation that's very important to implement effectively. Um, ICRC, we have produced a model law that can provide some, some guidance to states in this respect, also available on our website. And then a number of other positive obligations, not necessarily time bound, related to victim assistance, um, environmental decontamination, cooperation and assistance among states parties, and of course, working to universalize the treaty, but I won't go into these in detail. And the last point that needs to be done uh, not an obligation for states parties, but more so for the UN Secretary General, the first meeting of states parties needs to be convened within a year from the entry into force. So by 21st of January 2022, we need to have a first meeting of states parties, which brings me to the second uh, part of your question, what the first MSP should do. According to the TPNW, there are essentially three things that the first meeting of states parties must decide on. Um, this is explicitly mentioned in the treaty. It must adopt rules of procedure. And it would be very good if those rules of procedure provide for the effective participation of international organizations and civil society. And I mean, by effective participation, something more than simply attending as observers, which is already uh, stipulated under the treaty that they will participate as observers. And then it must decide on two very important deadlines. The deadline by which uh, any nuclear weapons possessing states which eventually might join the treaty need to eliminate nuclear weapons programs. Um, this should already be decided at the first MSP. 
and the deadline by which any uh, state hosting nuclear weapons on their territory must remove those nuclear weapons when they join the treaty. Again, another deadline that needs to be um, decided already at this stage. And then another point, not substantive, but very important in my view, all the admin aspects of treaty monitoring. So I'm talking about questions like around the secretariat or an implementation support unit or something similar. Um, the mechanics of how treaty monitoring is done, it would be good if the MSP could settle these questions or any subsidiary bodies that may be needed uh, to address different, different aspects of the treaty. So these are a couple of areas uh, where I feel, and the treaty stipulates that the first MSP must decide upon. And then um, I would have a number of ideas on, on areas where it would be good that the MSP focuses, um, but maybe we can touch upon these mm -hmm. later. Thanks, Irene. <laughs> yes, I mean, let's definitely come back to that later in the discussion. Um, as we sort of move to think about the sort of strategy that the, you know, the TPNW might need. Um, but, you know, you've outlined quite a list of things there that need to be thought about and I and, and implemented. And, and I guess also that will depend on in part on the composition of the state's parties themselves, you know, um, some of those provisions and, and which apply. But I'm thinking sort of of other humanitarian disarmament style treaties, uh, like the Mine Ban Treaty and the the conventional cluster munitions in the past. I mean, these are treaties in which civil society has played a pretty big role, as you mentioned before. And the leadership and the support that those uh, campaigns uh, lent to those regimes earlier in their life, I mean, they were significant factors. Um, I'd be really interested, Alicia, in hearing uh, from you, what does ICANN have in mind in terms of the role that it's going to play, its plans and priorities to to um, contribute to the regime leading up to this first meeting of states parties, or indeed in the next few years. Um, tell us more. Sure, um, and thanks for having me and just for the this really great series of events that, that UNIDIR has put on uh, for, uh, in pre preparation for the first meeting. Um, so, you know, as many of you well know, uh, ICANN's uh, kind of founding mission is to prohibit and eliminate uh, nuclear weapons, and a significant part of this mission uh, was achieving the first global prohibition uh, of nuclear weapons, which we now have in the TPNW. So, continuing uh, the TPNW regime and preparing for the first meeting of states parties uh, is a really important um, part of ICANN's work in the next year and the years to come. Um, looking kind of specifically in, in this next year leading up to the first meeting, um, ICANN will be working closely with states parties, uh, with all of kind of the ICANN uh, partner organizations around the world, with uh, the ICRC, with other international organizations to prepare for this meeting and to prepare to have a productive and substantial meeting uh, that can take forward uh, implementation of the treaty on many of the points that uh, Irini brought up in her remarks, um, and also to continue our work uh, to work towards the full universalization of the treaty. Um, we'd like to see, you know, as many states participating in the first meeting of states parties as states parties um, to, to take forward the regime. Looking ahead, in addition to continuing uh, to work for the full implementation of the treaty to take forward uh, steps that are agreed at the first meeting of states parties. Um, we would also want to continue to work towards the full universalization uh, of the treaty, including by having uh, states that do not currently support the treaty uh, to join it, you know, in some, some of them in the near future as uh, the treaty's normative impact uh, continues to grow and we see that the treaty can have an impact uh, even in countries that have not joined it or, or do not currently support it. And so we'll be continuing to work as we have done in the past with uh, city parliaments, uh, with um, federal parliaments, with um, universities, faith communities uh, in these countries to continue to build support uh, for the treaty at the federal level. Thanks very much, Alicia. Um, 
you're being very tactful there and you're talking about states that don't currently support the uh, the treaty um, in the context of this sort of question of universalization. And it'd be kind of interesting to talk a little bit more about this. And to that, I want to turn to you, Nick, because you've written a lot about the sort of ideational normative aspects of the ban treaty. And in your recent work, I'm aware that you focused on the respective importance of four different categories of state, in, as you see it, in terms of universalization activities. So, I mean, could you tell us a bit more about this and, and also sort of unpack why universalization is important in the TPNW's case uh, beyond what Alicia's already told us and, and what you think might make it sort of particularly challenging? Yeah, we'll do, John. Thanks. And thanks for inviting me along to this. Um, doing it from my kitchen, as you can see, as we uh, deep in the middle of our third lockdown in the UK. Um, so uh, Alex Clement and I have just finished a paper on universalizing the ban treaty, which is for a forthcoming uh, special issue of the Journal for Peace and Nuclear Disarmament, uh, which is on the ban treaty. Uh, that journal is based out of Nagasaki University. Uh, so in it, we, we argue that thinking about universalization makes sense in terms of four categories of state the nine nuclear armed states, the 30 or so nuclear client states for those states on behalf of whom nuclear deterrent threats can be made by their nuclear patrons, uh, particularly the NATO members, uh, the nuclear disarmament advocacy states for those like Ireland um, that have championed nuclear disarmament in regional politics, in world politics, and constitute the core group really that drove the humanitarian initiative forward, drove the ban treaty forward. And then fourth, we've got this larger group of the remaining non-nuclear armed states that can be supportive, but also can be at times ambivalent about nuclear disarmament for a variety of reasons. Uh, and, and these four categories of states will require different strategies, I think, to engage them with, uh, to, to engage them with the, the signature and ratification process and where that's not gonna be forthcoming in the short term to engage them with the underlying humanitarian arguments that have gotten us to this place in the global politics of nuclear weapons. But I think the, the immediate focus has to be on getting uh, the advocacy states into the regime and as many of the non-nuclear armed states as possible, particularly those 122 that, that uh, uh, supported uh, the, the negotiation of the, of the treaty at the UN in, in July in 2017. Uh, and the simple reason for this is that numbers matter. Now, that's an obvious thing to say when we're thinking about bringing a treaty into force, but it's particularly important for this treaty. And I've just, I've just outlined three reasons why, if that's all right, John, for why it's really important for this treaty. First, it's because the, the political and moral authority of this treaty and of its core norms and principles inc will increase with the number of ratifications. And that's really the only means by which, by, at a collective level, this treaty can have, it, have effect in, in the global politics of nuclear weapons. It's through that political and moral authority. And the second reason relates to this, the reason why weight of numbers is especially important for this treaty. And that's because, as we know, all the key centers of power in world politics, of political, economic, and military power stand outside this treaty. So the US, Russia, China, Japan, India, NATO, Europe, all stand outside it. And we know that many of those are directly opposed to it. So weight of numbers becomes particularly important in virtue of that fact. Uh, and, and the third reason is because uh, this treaty is not really introducing new norms and principles for the vast majority of states. It's consolidating what's there and taking them forward in some ways from conditional norms and prohibitions into unconditional norms and prohibitions and obligations. So for, for the majority of non-nuclear armed states that have already accepted in other instruments the treaty core norms and principles, and a lot of these have got a long-standing track record of supporting nuclear disarmament, supporting the unconditional prohibition of nuclear weapons, subscribe to the Austrian government's humanitarian pledge back in 2014. So fulfilling the, the, any additional legal and, and administrative obligations, as have been mentioned, resulting from joining the ban treaty should be, on that basis, fairly uncontroversial. Now, they're going to face a lot of sustained pressure that the, the state parties to the treaty are going to have to work with prospective members to try and alleviate some of that pressure coming from those that stand outside and oppose the treaty. But as well as engaging with some of the nuclear client states, building up the numbers of, of, of states that are 
inclined through their political history, things they've ascribed to, things they've signed up to, are, are, are well on board with, with the core norms and obligations of this treaty. I think in the, in the short term, that's where the focus has to be. Uh, and, and the question then is, at the first meeting of states parties, how are states going to bring this into their discussions? Are we going to see an action plan emerge from this? Are we going to see an implementation support unit? Are we going to see a working group on universalization to engage with, with a broader group of non-nuclear weapon states that have yet to sign up to the treaty? Thanks, Nick. I think that's, that's it. That's up very well for sort of how we're going to roll forward in this discussion. Um, and to do that, I'd like to turn to Jamie Walsh. Um, not to put you on the spot, Jamie, but I'd be interested to, to know what you, you think of, of what Nick's just said. Um, and, and also what you think states should be doing, those who intend to participate or observe in the first meeting of states parties, what should they be doing to prepare for this? I mean, uh, we don't know exactly when that meeting will be, but it will be within a year uh, or less than a year now. So it would have to be before the end of January next year. Um, so what, what, in your view, do, th do you think they should be doing? Just before I go to you, there are questions beginning to trickle in on the Q&A, and I encourage uh, more. Uh, what I'll do after you've spoken, Jamie, is, is we'll circle back and we'll, we'll uh, begin tackling some of those questions. But I just want to give everybody on the panel a chance to, to, to have a kickoff. Uh, so over to you. Thanks. Thanks very much, John. And... Uh... Uh, good afternoon to everybody that's that's joined us as well, and uh, and just want to say first of all thanks to Unidir for for inviting us to uh, to participate on the panel today. Um, I have to say that this series of of workshops has has really been of the highest quality and and, and exactly the kind of exercise I think uh, that we need as a as a disarmament community of, of of states, international organisations, civil society, academia, to examine what exactly it is the TPMW is is going to mean. Uh, in practice, um, and and thanks for for posing the the question to me on what states uh, and observers to the first MSP need to do to prepare. Um, I mean, a lot of the, the the conversation so far around the TPNW, including in some of these events, has has you know rightly focused on on some conceptual questions. It's looked at things like the TPNW's relationship to the NPT. It's looked at positive obligations. It's looked at practical outcomes from the first MSP. Uh, and its place as well in the, the kind of broader disarmament structure. And those are, are, as I say, hugely important questions and certainly require a lot of, a lot of deep thought. Um, but, and, and you'll have to excuse me for being the, the, the boring bureaucrat, I guess, on the panel. Um, but we know of a treaty that's, that's entered into force. It's, uh, it's a reality. Uh, and under the treaty's provisions, we have to hold, as we know, the first MSP within 12 months. Uh, and states parties need to address the very practical issues that arise from such a meeting and consider really in, in, in great detail the nuts and bolts that are necessary to, uh, to make a treaty like this operate uh, successfully in, in practice. Uh, and there's a couple of things that I've just kind of flagged that you know, are just the most immediate things that we need to uh, look at straight away. Of course, the first one is the date of the meeting. You know, there's a lot happening in the disarmament calendar at the moment. There's a lot of disruption. Um, in our ability to meet, you know, hence why we're having this call right now via Zoom as opposed to in a, a room in the, in the pallet. Um, and we need to look, take a serious look at where an MSP of, of this scale might actually fit. And I think under normal circumstances, you know, if we look at the historical example of the CCM, for example, you have 1,200 delegates, 40 states parties for the CCM, more again, 45, 46 signatory states, I think 34 observer states, 20 international organizations, that's a massive undertaking. We really need to give some practical thought uh, into, into the organization of, of a meeting like that. The duration of the meeting as well, of course, is another issue. Nothing set in stone on, on that, of course, and there's nothing mandated. It doesn't, it's not mandated to be a certain length of, of time, um, but it needs to be long enough to consider the very wide range of issues that we're looking at. Um, and not so long, however, to impose a major financial burden on some of the states. You know, we've got a lot of uh, meeting fatigue as well, of course. Um, there are certain things that we don't want to leave either until uh, we all meet each other on the first day of the first MSP. Uh, really essential things like the provisional agenda for the meeting, a provisional program of work, 
Uh, Irene, you mentioned uh, the rules of procedure. Um, and absolutely, I mean, there's uh, Article 8.2 in the treaty says that the meeting of states parties shall adopt its rules of procedure at its first session uh, and that pending the, the adoption of the, the ROP that we can use the rules of procedure that we use during the negotiation of the treaty. But I mean, the question is, are they still fully suitable for a first meeting of states parties? Uh, do they need to be amended even slightly to make them more in line with the type of rules of procedure that we have for conventions like this? Um, particular issues around observer states, for example, or, uh, or states and parties may wish to make amendments uh, to how decisions are taken. Uh, no one wants, of course, to create additional work for themselves, but we need to satisfy ourselves that all states parties are, are fully comfortable uh, with the rules of procedure. We've got other issues as well, like um, the confirmation of the president, for example, the first, uh, meet, uh, for the first meeting of states parties and for uh, officers in the bureau and other office holders. Um, and of course, then as well, a, a sticky issue oftentimes here in Geneva, which is arrangements for meeting the costs of the first meeting of states parties as well. Uh, again, the treaty does say in Article 9.1 that the costs are to be borne by states parties and observer states. Um, but there are other questions as well, you know, and I, I think there's an added layer of complexity with the UN's new financial system, new rules that are in place for meetings that are held on UN premises and that the funds need to be in place before a meeting can be called. And so how do we address that? How do we address any potential non-payment? Those kind of questions, those are things we need to be thinking and, uh, and talking about. And even at this very early stage, you know, do we need to be giving kind of very serious consideration to things like the establishment of a voluntary trust fund or a working capital fund uh, for the treaty? Those are, are kind of very core, as I say, a bit bureaucratic, but core issues. Um, most conventions would need to have some kind of, of meeting in advance, of course, to act as a, a kind of a clearinghouse for all of those procedural and administrative issues. Uh, so it's not to overburden the first MSP itself. And a PREPCOM, of course, is standard practice to ensure that all states' parties are, are clear and, as I say, comfortable on those arrangements that have been made. But even on that issue, there's complications as well. Any PREPCOM ha would not, must, must not be too long, I would say. I think for the CCM, had a good example there. We had a single day, two sessions over, over a single day, just, uh, as I mentioned, to act as a clearinghouse for all of those admin and procedural decisions that need to be taken. But aside from the, the procedural elements, I think that a preparatory, a really robust preparatory process also offers an opportunity to look beyond issues of, of procedure and, and really lay the groundwork for substance. Uh, a few colleagues have, have mentioned it during their interventions today, you know, the type of thing that we need to be thinking about an action plan, perhaps, perhaps a political declaration. Those are kind of models that were followed in previous conventions. Um, and, and of course, the prep comms for the APLC, the ATT, the CCM, they all considered drafts uh, of, of substantive issues as well. The CCM looked at a draft of the NTN declaration and discussed the action plan. It also considered a work program for the following year, including the architecture for the convention, which, you know, as Irene pointed out, is, is hugely important for the operation of the, of the treaty. Um, so some of this sounds less than exciting, but I think there are important elements in, in states' parties getting a sense of ownership over the treaty and most importantly in states parties making the treaty function as it was intended and um, so uh, in short what what can we be doing i, I think uh, quite a lot is the answer thanks thanks Sorry jamie for being so lengthy. no i think that's very helpful it's very comprehensive and I, I sort of to paraphrase i think it was bismarck who said that you know laws are like sausages no one wants to see how they're made but but it's important isn't it and you know these are these are actually, you know, uh, we're, we're putting these things out here as, as questions, as sort of a problematic, but actually these are good problems to have. I mean, so much of what we end up dealing with in disarmament and arms control these days is essentially not much more than wringing of hands, right? It's, it's, it's worrying about situations that uh, we have very limited control to do anything about, but this is actually a new regime and these are decisions that need to be made in a concrete way in order to move the regime forward. So let's have the discussion in, in that light, that these are good problems, not bad problems uh, to be talking about. What I want to do now is uh, deal with a couple of the questions which have, have started trickling in, also to allow you as speakers to sort of gather your thoughts a bit, to think about the question of, uh, and, and one or two of the questions we have, for example, from Yuri uh, and, and others in the feed is, 
you know, about these big questions about the strategic plan, about the plans and priorities. So we'll come back to that in a minute or two. But before we do, I just wanted to sort of sweep up a couple of these, uh, these other questions we've got. And to do that, I thought I'd go back to you, Irene, first of all. Um, so one question I had for you, particularly in light of what Alicia had, had done, which was to talk a bit about ICANN's plan and plans and priorities, was maybe if you could tell us briefly a little bit about um, the mechanics of how it works in the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement, what they'll be doing uh, with respect to the TPNW, because you know this, this is a humanitarian inspired treaty and, and the movement has been very significant in its development. Uh, also, uh, you mentioned uh, very tactfully, uh, one TPNW party doesn't have a CSA, a comprehensive safeguards agreement with the IAEA. Someone was wondering maybe you could let the rest of us know who, who that is without picking on them. If, if you don't want to do that, then just send me a message and I'll, I'll be prepared to take the fall and say it. Um, and then we also had another interesting question uh, from my colleague Pavel, uh, who, who I think knows the answer to this question already, but uh, maybe uh, Irene, if you, you, uh, and you, with your lawyer's hat, could, could say uh, what, what the deal is about observers. And I mean, in principle, even states that currently oppose the treaty, could they attend the meeting of states parties as observers? So that's just to get things moving. And then I'll be coming back to other speakers with respect to some of these other questions, Nick. Uh, it maybe uh, might come back to you on the MPT question uh, in there from Reto um, and, um, and anyone else uh, from the panel who'd like to chip in there. But Irene, if you'd like to start. Sure, thanks. Thanks, John. Uh, let's, let's take the question on the Red Cross Red Crescent movement first and the involvement that the movement will have in the life cycle of the treaty or in the life of the treaty, I would call it a cycle. So the movement, by movement, we mean obviously the ICRC, the Federation of Red Cross Red Crescent Societies, and the individual national societies, Red Cross and Red Crescent. The movement has been involved in the process leading up to the TPNW in the three humanitarian impact conferences um, and very much engaged on that. And currently, we are. Um, implementing a movement action plan on the non-use prohibition and elimination of nuclear weapons. It's the second four-year action plan. We already had one and um, it expires at the end of this year and we are planning to have a new probably four-year action plan for the movement. And this action plan basically is a framework to coordinate the ICRC, IFRC and national society activities and efforts to raise awareness of the humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons. So among other things, this action plan commits every component of the movement to promote the universalization of the TPNW and to promote the faithful and effective implementation of the treaty, including as regards uh, assisting states in adopting national legislation, policies, and other measures needed to translate the TPNW into domestic law. So ICRC, national societies, and the federation, each within their mandate, they can be expected to be closely involved in um, assisting governments in implementing the treaty, including through public communications, contacts with actors such as parliamentarians, government officials, obviously, briefing national IHL committees, training armed forces and civil society, notably on the legal aspects related to nuclear weapons and IHL, providing guidance on interpreting the treaty, provisions of the treaty and a number of other activities. And I already mentioned some of the material that the ICRC has prepared, like the model law um, and the model declarations. We also have a number of briefing notes on interpretation of treaty provisions, and there is more of this to come. Um, and the last point on the movement, the movement, um, the, the TPNW meeting of states parties are very much a natural arena for the movement, national societies and the ICRC to engage, given the strong humanitarian rationale of the treaty. This is why I mentioned earlier, it will be very important for the rules of procedure of the MSP to to allow for such effective participation of stakeholders other than states, including obviously the movement. 
Um, the question on the which which uh, TPNW state party doesn't have a comprehensive safeguards agreement in force. I have no problem answering that. I mean, it's public on the IAEA website, and I, I didn't mean to um, I didn't mean to mention this in a negative way. It's the state of Palestine. It has signed a comprehensive uh, safeguards agreement and a small quantities protocol, but it is not in force yet. And I didn't mean to say that they have no willingness to put it in force. They signed it fairly recently. I mean, everyone understands why they could not sign it before. And it's just not in force yet. So for them, it is a positive obligation. That's the only reason I mentioned it. And then the last point on observers very quickly, based on the TPNW, every state shall be, that is not a party, shall be invited as an observer. So that includes supporters and states that are more critical or yeah, more opposed to the TPNW. Now, procedurally, of course, as we know from other uh, weapons and disarmament treaties, there is a procedure there with um, approving or, or agreeing upon the participation of observing states somehow, depending on the rules of procedure. So it might very well be that in the rules of procedure, there is something saying that Yes, those states are invited to participate, but then their attendance as observers has to be approved by the meeting of states parties or not. I don't know, but there might be another procedurally attend as observers. There might be um, something in the rules of procedure requiring an extra agreement of states parties at the MSP, as is frequently done with other treaties where if there are any objections to any state, you know, attending as an observer, it might or might not be the case, but, but procedurally that would not be uncommon. Thanks, Irene. That's very helpful, um, I think, in, in starting to answer some of these questions. Nick, can I go to you now? And one question we have here is that the TPNW has been facing some criticism with regard to its possible negative effects on the NPT, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. How could the first meeting of states parties respond in terms of atmospherics and in terms of results to respond to such concerns? And I guess uh, this question assumes that the NPT review conference, which has already been postponed twice, would actually occur in the late summer of this year. So I, I, I would assume that the first meeting of states parties of the TPNW would occur subsequent to that. Yeah, thanks, John, and, and thanks to, to Russo for your question. Um, th this is a, a delicate one, I suppose, uh, because non-nuclear weapon state parties to the NPC that have signed and ratified, or just signed so far, uh, the TPNW, um, as far as I'm aware, none of those states have said anything or done anything, and others can correct me if I'm wrong, that openly challenges or makes a point of difference uh, in terms of, of a choice between one institution or the other between the MPT and the Ban Treaty. Now, there has been writing by some academics uh, and others that have um, argued that the MPT isn't fit for purpose uh, and that eventually it will need to be transformed or... Or, or replaced in, in some form, um, and that there is, you know, one can imagine futures in which some states join the TPNW and then decide to withdraw from the MPT. Um, now, I think that's highly unlikely, highly unlikely. The MPT remains of, of great import for the vast majority of states' parties to it, um, not least around, uh, around the... the support for peaceful uses within that treaty, which is of, of key significance for many states that have signed the ban treaty and hopefully will sign it in the future. So this is a criticism that is not innate to the ban treaty. The ban treaty is very clear in its text that it is embedded within uh, the existing institutional frameworks of the MPT and the wider nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation regime. It de quite deliberately borrows language and builds upon that. And other, other people here don't need me to tell them that in any more detail. Um, so this, this discourse of some innate division 
uh, between the, the ban treaty in terms of its text and its and its adherence and the NPT in terms of its text and its and its state parties is coming from outside of, of the TPNW and outside of its of its state signatories um, and that that is a discourse uh, are, that is uh, that is framing division within the global politics of nuclear weapons and nuclear disarmament as framing the ban treaty and the humanitarian initiative that preceded it as a, as, as a source, a cause of that division and refusing to acknowledge that it is symptomatic of divisions that already existed and therefore displacing where core fractures lie in the global politics of nuclear weapons, displacing them onto the existence of the ban treaty in terms of creating some division between the NPT and the ban treaty uh, and, and brushing aside the fact that the treaty was in many ways that and the whole political process the movement that that led to it that was mobilized by a, a, a transnational network of igos and ngos and states this movement that gathered pace remarkable momentum over to, uh, uh, what from about 2010 to 2017 when the treaty was negotiated that was in response to two or three decades of, of, of trying many things within the established practices of the NPT. Um, so I think this is, this is a narrative that's coming from outside the NPT. And therefore, I don't think there's a, 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 a significant obligation upon those states that are parties to the TPNW to, to have to continually rebut those criticisms. Um, I think the treaty speaks for itself. The statements and actions on behalf of of states parties to the TPNW in many ways speaks for themselves in terms of continued support, unequivocal support for the MPT. Thanks very much, Nick. Uh, Jamie, did you have a hot pursuit? Yeah, I, sorry, John, just first of all, I'm conscious I, I, I didn't even re reply to your first question about what Nick had said in the first instance in terms of embedding the Norman. Just to say on that, I, I, I mean, I completely uh, I completely agree, of course, um, numbers matter, as, as Nick rightly said, um, and as states, we don't only have the, uh, you know, it's not just a responsibility to try um, and universalize the treaty, we have an obligation under Article 12 to do so, so I completely agree with Nick on that, but I just wanted to come in on that NPT point um, in particular, because, you know, the uh, Ireland and is, is so closely associated to the NPT uh, in that respect, I mean, we've, you know, often term ourselves as the, the, the mother or father of, of the NPT from the Irish resolutions from uh, six, from 58 to 61 and so on. Um, and I think Nick is absolutely right in saying that the, the narrative uh, that in some way the TPNW is, is contradictory or undermines the NPT, I think that's, that's a constructed narr narrative, not really based or founded in reality and certainly not based or founded in anything that has been said by any state uh, that has advocated for first during the negotiations to conclude the treaty and subsequently any of the state's parties. And I think there's a good kind of trail of evidence on that as well. If you look at the NPT meetings themselves, if you look at the PrepCon from about 2018 onwards, um, I think there's any of the states that have been closely associated to the TPNW, the, the language that they've used in those preparatory committee meetings, in those interactions uh, at the in the context of the NPT, they have all underscored how, complement, how complementary the, the TPNW is uh, to the NPT. And in that kind of broader framework, of course, that, that Nick mentioned, you know, there are other legal instruments and other uh, political arrangements and so on, some are formal, some are informal, that support uh, the full implementation of the NPT. And I don't think we have that similar kind of discussion around any of those that we have for the TPNW. So it's a pity it's drifted in that way. But yeah, I don't think there's necessarily any obligation on the state's parties of, TPN, of the TPNW to try and prove, as it were, that the, that the treaty is not harmful to the NPT. I think it's already been shown in the, in the statements and the actions that, uh, that those states have, have, have done. So thank you. Thanks very much, Jamie. Uh, well, the, the question of the NPT and the TPNW is sort of, it's become a hardy perennial uh, and, and thanks for engaging uh, with that. Uh, what I'd like to do with the remaining time that we have, uh, we're about three quarters of the way through now, is really, uh, this is a follow-up question for the entire panel. And I think that in some of your remarks, you've sort of set us up quite well for this, uh, this question. 
let's imagine that you were writing the strategic plan for the for the chair of the first meeting of states parties or the chair designate that would form the basis of a draft action plan for the TPNW's first five years. Now, these action plans uh, have been features of other regimes. Uh, you actually, Irene mentioned that the, the, the Red Cross, Red Crescent movement has its own action plan. But let's imagine you're putting together a, a strategic plan, an, an action plan. What, what, what would you recommend what are your top recommendations for what would need to be in it? And this relates, I think, to one or two of the questions we've had in the feed, which are asking about the, the priorities in terms of the, the political consolidation of the regime. But, but uh, my question is more wide ranging. It's also the, the real practicalities, um, what you think is important. You don't need to be comprehensive. It's just really what you, 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 would, you would personally prioritize in terms of, of what would need to be in it. To that, uh, would you like to start, Alicia, since uh, we, we haven't given you much of a shake of the stick yet? So. <laughs> sure. Well, I mean, luckily, I think there, I've agreed with a lot of the points that have been made, uh, you know, particularly on this TPW NPT question. Um, but to go to, to your question about the action plan, um, I can't, of course, I can't give kind of a comprehensive overview. There's, I think, a lot that would need to go into this. Um, but one element that I'd like to, to touch upon is really continuing the humanitarian thread, the humanitarian initiative that uh, really launched this treaty and has been such an important uh, part of the treaty in changing the conversation around nuclear weapons. Uh, and kind of concretely, uh, the treaty really uh, embodies uh, the humanitarian angle by uh, requiring the victim assistance and environmental remediation uh, obligations, which I think will be very important to the first meeting of states parties uh, because it is an obligation that, you know, in the treaty, it does primarily uh, rest first and foremost with impacted states, but there's of course the obligation of all states to cooperate uh, to implement these provisions. So it's, these are obligations that will take a long time. They're not going to be uh, finalized in even the first five years, but it is something that states can immediately begin to start taking action on, on starting to address uh, these, these provisions and, and take steps forward. So certainly it's, it's not the only thing that should be in this action plan. Of course, there should also be steps on, uh, you know, ensuring the implementation of prohibitions, expanding universalization, which is, as Jamie mentioned, is a legal requirement under the treaty. Um, looking towards the uh, in institutionalization, uh, creating the necessary structures, and so forth. But uh, there's already been, uh, you know, a few different articles written about uh, victim assistance and, uh, to some extent, environmental remediation. How it's been taken forward uh, in previous similar treaties um, and some, you know, initial analysis uh, on how that could be done uh, at this first meeting. So I think that's, that will be one uh, important component of uh, first action plan in the first five years of the treaty. Thanks, thanks, Alicia. That's really helpful. Uh, Irene, do you want to go next? Sure, happy to. Um, I think it's a tricky question because when you asked this question, my immediate reaction was, well, the treaty already sets the ambitions for the meeting of states parties quite high. And it's a bit... Well, I understand the importance of an action plan, a five-year action plan, a lot can happen in five years. And many of the tasks that the meeting of states parties will have to work on are triggered by a state possessing or hosting nuclear weapons joining the treaty. So in other ways, when I mentioned earlier what the MSP needs to do was based on the membership of the TPNW now. If that membership changes, there's a lot of things that the MSP will have to decide upon. Um, and it might not be entirely probable that a nuclear weapon state joins in the next five years, but a, a state hosting nuclear weapons, I see, is much less likely. And there, the meeting of states parties would have to decide um, on a number of things, including reports towards uh, on a progress towards the implementation of the obligation of this host state to remove their nuclear weapons on their territory, et cetera. But if we can 
um, think in terms of areas of focus, then along the lines that Alicia spoke earlier, I would say the two areas, in my view, where the first MSP um, should focus on already at this stage and that should be part of this action plan is some sort of strategy or outreach plan on universalizing the treaty. So outreach and specific approaches and activities to invite more states to join the treaty. And then some sort of a framework of international cooperation and assistance as regards victim assistance and environmental remediation. Because I think even though those two aspects are not the core prohibitions of the treaty that get the spotlight, they are nevertheless, first of all, very important to people affected by nuclear weapons testing and very important to a number of states also who have either joined or are considering joining the treaty. So victim assistance and environmental remediation and the sort of give and take between obligations of states whose territory is affected or where individuals in their jurisdiction are affected and other states who are not directly affected but are in a position to provide assistance, I think this would benefit from a more global approach of some sort of framework of international cooperation and assistance to ensure that these obligations are, are implemented effectively and to the maximum extent, which is also, as I said, the most important thing for the people. And I fully agree with Alicia that in our view also, the humanitarian aspect of the treaty must be maintained going forward, and that includes possibly additional research on the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons on individuals and on the environment. And that is why I mentioned earlier, it might be good to reflect this in the, in the mechanism, monitoring mechanism of the treaty with some sort of a subsidiary body or, or otherwise task with uh, following on this aspect of further research and developing the evidence base of the consequences of nuclear weapons as one example. Thanks, Irene. And uh, that prompts me to briefly advertise the recording of the first uh, event in this series, which uh, in which uh, Bonnie Doherty and uh, Renata Hesman Delacroix both discussed in some detail these, these um, obligations for victim assistance, environmental remediation. And so if, if listeners out there are interested, they should check that out. Um, as well as uh, the articles out there, um, extant and forthcoming, and Bonnie Doherty has written a very good piece and uh, Renata and others uh, will have a piece published quite soon. So do check those out. Next, I'm going to go to you, Nick, and I'm going to give Jamie the last word. Uh, so, Nick, do you agree with uh, what Alicia and Irene have been saying? I mean, what are your views, particularly uh, in the area of universalization? Thanks, John. Um, I'm probably the least expert amongst us in terms of the nuts and bolts of, of going through treaties into implementation and, and embedding it in, in the formal practices and processes and informal practices of international diplomacy. but. Um, I mean, the, the big question for me is, is the one, you know, when, when we've got PhD students studying an issue, one of the questions or issues we say is follow the money. So, so who is going to pay for all this? I think that is a really serious question for this treaty. Um, I mean, I think just tossing up back of the envelope, maybe the entire process through the three intergovernmental conferences, the money that came from states and foundations to support civil society and so on, getting through the UN process was what, maybe about 10 million euros, perhaps something like that. So in the, in, in the big scheme of things, it's not much money, but in, in state budgets, that's a ton of cash. Uh, and a lot of that came from Norway. And as we know, that tap has now run dry. So I think a serious question is, is who is gonna, how is this gonna pay for itself? Um, so I don't know what, what Jamie might think about that, but that is a, that, that's a very serious question now for the meeting of states parties I'm looking forward. Um, but I, I think, um, I mean, look, looking at what happened with, and you all know this better than me, John, with CCM and then with, with the Mind Bound Treaty too, when we saw the, the adoption of an action plan uh, after the NCN um, at the first meeting of states parties there that served as a roadmap leading up to its first formal review conference. I think an action plan is obviously going to be something very important and useful to consider. Um, with the CCM, we saw two states parties act as formal coordinators for universalization 
acting through an informal working group similar to the Mind Band Treaties contact group. Um, so I, I, I am assuming that given the familiarity with which diplomats at this meeting of first meeting of states parties for the Band Treaty, the familiarity they'll have with these other mechanisms, I would anticipate there'll be discussions around this. Um, but the other interesting thing is, is, is the processes around becoming an observer treaty. What, what, what are the processes going to be for, for applying for observer status? Are applications going to be reviewed? What are going to be the expectations of observer states? Will observer states be expected to make some changes in some way to make a positive contribution to the TPNW? I think that's a really interesting one, given the, the, the political desire to see some NATO Europe state, or perhaps Canada too, uh, come into the fold of the TPNW with, with one step or one toe, if you like, through observer status. But, but is it legitimate for them to do that, to be enabled to do that and continue to talk the talk that values nuclear weapons and nuclear deterrence? That seems a really tricky question. So what are, what's going to be the expectations upon states that want to lean into the treaty, but are still subscribing to the value of, uh, of nuclear weapons and nuclear deterrence? Um, and just to, I just saw Thomas had, had put a a remark about the absurdity of, of states leaving, joining the ban treaty and leaving the NPT. And, that, and that's quite right. The TPNW quite purpose, purposefully does not force a choice, doesn't force a choice at all between the ban treaty and the NPT. Thanks very much, Nick. Finally, Jamie, I'm gonna to come to you um, for your views on, on, on what you think, you know, off the top of your head needs, needs to be prioritized in terms of, you know, a strategy moving forward post uh, you know, or for the one MSP and beyond. Uh, also, another little question I thought I'd drop in, in, and you've done this to yourself, Jamie, because you're sitting in front of a banner that says Ireland UN Security Council, minute, one or two minutes you have remaining. No pressure. Th thanks, John. You always just give me the easiest of questions. I mean, it's just fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, no, for, first of all, on the idea around a five-year action plan, um, I have to say, I think, uh, I think it's a good model that has been used pretty successfully in the past, particularly, you know, you can think off the top of your head, like the CCM and, and, and the APLC and those types of plans and so on. Um, and we've already heard from, from uh, Alicia and from Irene on some of the really important elements that are going to be in there. I think uh, added to a five-year action plan, though, I would probably put in a more kind of a, a shortened public facing type of document, that kind of thing might be useful to consider as well, you know, type, a type of declaration or something along the lines of that, that could focus on implementation, uh, the humanitarian uh, aspects of the treaty and the practical impact it's having, you know, something along the lines of that. And then in terms of the actual action plan itself, I mean, you know, how long is a piece of string and, and in terms of what you would like to include in it. Um, there's individual aspects. I think that the universalization aspect has been well covered, particularly Alicia and, and, and Irene have, have mentioned it and Nick in terms of embedding the norm and how important that is. Um, but one, one element that hasn't been mentioned is how to ensure that the treaty is really firmly rooted in the best possible scientific and expert advice. And I think that's really a, a, an interesting element to consider um, and, and how that might play out in terms of the, and how that might be elaborated further uh, in an action plan. Um, aside from the, the normative aspects, I think it's essential that the treaty is viewed as a kind of a, a pragmatic basis for the total elimination of nuclear weapons. You know, that it isn't just seen as this uh, idealistic treaty that we can ignore kind of thing. If you're an, in, in a, 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 an opponent of the treaty, as it were, that there is actually a meaningful pragmatic element of the treaty and address those issues around things like verification, the, the competent international authority, really address those kind of things um, head on. It's a, a pretty large task, I think, probably for a first MSP, but certainly those are the kind of things I think that we need to be thinking about and need to be considering now. Um, I also agree with Irene that there should be a focus on the positive obligations and, and show how it can have a real and practical uh, impact through, uh, if it's an international cooperation framework, something along the lines of that that focuses on victim assistance and environmental remediation. You know, those are core elements of the treaty and I think really uh, important to address as well in an action plan. On, on you know, the money Nick, Nick raised, who's going to pay? Um, I, I completely agree. I think that's always a really interesting question 
course, you know, it, it goes beyond who pays for the first MSP, the costs, the conference costs and so on. It's very clear how those are going to be paid for. It's on the basis of the UN scale of assessment is adjusted and so on. But we all know if we've been involved in this area or any area of diplomacy for a, a while that there are elements outside of that that we need to consider there needs to be a funding source for this kind of thing as well to really ensure that the, the appropriate type of work that's necessary for it to successfully uh, integrate, I think, into the international system is, is really achieved. So, so certainly that's another, another element that's really worth, uh, worth considering as well. Uh, on your very simple question, John, on, on SECO, uh, I think in, in fairness, is there like a mechanism within the Security Council for us to, to, to approach this realistically? You know, you have the five nuclear weapon states uh, as permanent members of the Security Council, and inevitably they would resist any such discussion of the TPNW or how it would you know, play into the security camps. But that's not to say that any opportunity that we would have to discuss nuclear weapons or the efficacy of the TPNW or how to integrate it, normalize it into the international system that we wouldn't be taking those, those options. And of course, we're not alone on the Security Council either. I mean, we have some great TPNW colleagues on the, on the council as well. And, uh, and maybe we can knock our heads together to see what we can do on that. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, Jamie. Well handled. Uh, that question about the Security Council actually came from our feed. So um, you've made somebody out there happy. You've answered their question. Um, I think we've come to the end of our time. So I, just before closing the meeting, I just want to make a couple of brief announcements. Um, first of all, um, I, the powers that be at Unidare told me I've committed a little boo-boo. So we have actually mentioned the names of one or two people today in our Q&A feed who asked questions. Um, if you don't want to be uh, it, your name mentioned in the recording of this event, which will go online within a couple of days, do contact me by email within the next 24 hours and we'll edit your name out somehow of the audio. Uh, so you can contact me at john.borry at un.org. Uh, equally, feel free to contact me if you want a copy of Nick's, uh, Nick's article in PDF. We have it, and we'd be happy to send that to you. Um, and I'd also uh, like to flag once again the fact that we have uh, recordings for each of the events in this series uh, available, both uh, from the Unity website, uh, the link that we flagged today, but also on YouTube. And uh, I'd like to thank our panelists uh, for giving us their time and their expertise today. Uh, thank you so much. I'd also thank, like to thank the Unidir team that produced the event, uh, including Jamie Revel, our uh, long-suffering program lead, and particularly Letitia Zarkan, our producer. And Letitia's done really fantastic work uh, working with the WMD and other strategic weapons program over the last 12 months or more, producing lots of uh, I think great Zoom events. So thank you so much. Uh, and then we will be circulating uh, for your feedback uh, a, a survey. Uh, this will come by email uh, from the Unidir team. Alternatively, you can complete the, uh, the survey form uh, now through the instructions in the chat window that Leticia will put up there. Uh, I'd encourage all of you to fill in the feedback form. Uh, this helps us to improve our events moving forward. And it's likely we'll have more events related to these topics uh, in the course of 2021. So tell us what you think and what you would like us to focus on. Uh, lastly, one or two of our um, contributors today uh, mentioned that there is an upcoming issue of the Journal for Peace and Nuclear Disarmament uh, that's uh, managed by the University of Nagasaki. This is going to be on TPNW implementation issues and several of the uh, contributors of the four events in the series uh, wrote or co-wrote papers uh, for that journal. Indeed, I, I guest edited the journal myself. Uh, and um, those contributions will be coming gradually online in coming months. So we really encourage you to look out for those. Uh, in due course, uh, we'll uh, no doubt uh, tweet those uh, through the Unidia uh, Twitter feed uh, and other social media, but also check out JPAND, uh, the Journal of Peace and Nuclear Disarmament. And then finally, thanks again uh, to all who attended this. Have a good day or a good night, depending on where you are. 
and where this, uh, where this event has found you. Uh, so have a wonderful rest of the day. Goodbye and good luck.